Welcome back. This is Larry Benko, W0QE, and today's video is about something you may not have run into, or maybe you have run into it but didn't realize it, or you did run into it and thought SimSmith was broken. And that's something that's called stale data, which can occur when sweeping. Stale data is easy to avoid once you realize what is happening within SimSmith. There are many ways to show the effect of stale data, and I will use a high-pass differential T-network where the values of capacitors C1 and C2 are not independent of each other. Looking at the SimSmith circuit, we see a high-pass T-network, which shows a match from 28.2 minus J41.3 ohms to 50 ohms with these values of components. I've back calculated so that these were nice even values, but it really doesn't matter. It shows a match. We see a differential capacitor in the overlay here, and the differential capacitor works as follows. When the value of C1 varies in an increasing fashion, we see the value of C2 va varying in a decreasing fashion. This does not have to be linear, but fundamentally, in an air variable differential capacitor, the outside plate on both sides is a stator plate or stator plates and the inside plate is a single rotator plate. The rotator varies between a certain amount of mesh with the stator on this side and a certain amount of mesh with the stator of this, on this side, giving us a function that looks like this. So if we see the effect of this, we see an impedance down here on the Smith chart of 28.2 minus J41.3. We see the effect of C1, the effect of L1, the effect of C2, and C1 and L2 have this nice relationship of I change one, I change the other one to match um, the formula. And that calculation is done in the plot window within the G block. That's the only place in this circuit where we can adjust the value of C2 based on C1. Now, if we look at the effect of what would happen if we sweep, there's only two things we can sweep here. We can sweep the C1, C2 relationship and we can sweep the L1. And let's look at sweep L1 for a moment and show that on the path. Let's show them both. We can see we can see the path plot again, and we can see the sweep of the value of L1, and we see that we get a match right here. And if we turn off the, the plot for a minute, we can click here and we see it occurs with a value of L1, which is 1.1 microhenries. Doing the same thing for C1, unfortunately, shows nothing matching 50 ohms, which is interesting because we know there's a combination here that matches 50 ohms. And if you look closely at, these, at this locus of points, we notice this outlier. And the outlier occurs down here at 30 picofarads. And this is typically what we would see when we have stale data. Now, what's happened here is pretty simple. If we look at the SimSmith manual, and we do a calculation for stale data, it, it shows one instance of it, and it's in the circuit evaluation uh, subsection of the manual. And it talks about the calculation being a left to right calculation. And what happens is as follows. When we go to sweep C1, SimSmith takes the next value in line for C1, starts with 30, goes to 300 in 10 picofarad steps. It takes the value that we are currently on, and let's do the first one. The first one would be 30 picofarads. 30 picofarads would be placed into, the, into, this, into this variable right here. And SimSmith knows nothing about the relationship of C1 to C2 until we do something with it. So it does the calculation where it takes this impedance, it takes the effect of this component, does all the calculations necessary to create voltages and currents everywhere, takes the L1, does the same thing, and when it gets to C2, C2 is still sitting at 110 picofarads, and it does the calculation there. So if we take this point right down here, we click on it, and then we go and make this calculation be a comment, what we see is a point that matches here, and this would be a sweep for a circuit that had this load impedance, we're sweeping C1 with L1 being a constant 1.1 microhenries and C2 being 110 picofarads. And we see that the point right here is C1 equals 30 picofarads. And that's what happens for the first data point when we have a stale data. Likewise, all these other data points 
use a value of C2 that is one sweep behind what it should be for the value of C1. So how do we fix this? Well, there's a lot of ways to fix this, but fundamentally it amounts to getting C1's, or excuse me, getting C2 set before the left to right calculation happens. And let's do that a couple different ways. The first way we can do it is to take a D block and put it here. And we will take this calculation and we'll place it in the D block and we'll make it a comment in the plot window so it's gone. And we notice things are fine. At this point in time, if we click here, we'll see that that occurs for C1B 220 picofarads. Now, the left to right calculation sets C1 to be 220 picofarads, then it goes through the circuit from left to right. The first thing it does is set C2, then it operates on the load and the effect of C1, the effect of L1, the effect of C2. When we get to, to this case, C2 has been set now to the appropriate value, an appropriate value for a 30 picofarad C1 is 300 picofarads, and there's our point right there. And eventually we get down to here, and we get to here, it's a 220 picofarad C1, and 110 picofarad Z2. Looking at this a little bit more closely, if we move the D block to here, we see the same correct plot. Moving the D block to here, we see the same correct plot. Moving it to here, all these cases set C2 before we actually do the left to right calculation. Moving it to here, we should see the stale data problem, and we do. Now, there are there other fixes for this? Sure there are, there's lots of them. We could have put this whole circuit in a ruse block and had the ruse block set the relationship of C2, C2 to C1. Anytime you have a block, and let's load that circuit just for a moment. Here we have the circuit loaded where the entire differential T circuit is within a ruse block. Also in the ruse block, we're going to set the capacitor value of C2 versus C1. It doesn't matter whether it's set before or after any plotting. SimSmith does the calculation left to right with all the calculations being done first and then it comes back and figures out all the plotting stuff. So it doesn't matter where I've plotted anything. I get the right value. Let's do that for a moment. Let's plot C1. And let's look at all the different things I plotted. Every single one of these is overlaid on top of each other, with the first one being pink, the second one being purple, etc., etc. And all we see is the last one, because the order of plotting goes from left to right also. We see everything being correct. Now, if we take this, comment it out, make the D block here be the block where C2 is set as a function of, C, of, of uh, C1. We see everything's correct again. If we make this block, which is just basically a, a blank block, which has nothing as, as far as the circuits in, inside, and we make it the calculation, we see the error. It occurred after the calculation involving C2. So there's lots of ways to fix this, but pretty much keep in mind, anytime you have a component whose value is a function of something that's being swept or a parameter whose value is a function of something being swept, you must get that value set before SimSmith actually does the circuit calculations. That's really all there is to it. This is just a little trick um, for newbies. It's something as an a person who's very familiar with SimSmith can run into occasionally. You don't always realize you're going to run into it, but when you see something like this, it's pretty easy to tell that it's not correct. Going back to a variant of the first circuit I showed, we have a D block which can set the value of C2, and we have a 
plot block, the plot block here can also set the value of C2. If C2 is set here for, without it being set here, this gives us a stale data problem. If we set it here, it really doesn't matter that it gets, that it gets reset here. It doesn't have any effect. So if we look at the, this case right here, which should be good, and we're going to plot the matching range of this circuit with these range of components. So I will sweep these components, and I see the typical locus of dots that you normally would see. And if I pick one of these, say this dot right here, it's one microhenry and 170 picofarads for C1, and that's the value we have. Now, you might look at this and say, this circuit looks good, but let's fix the circuit. We know this has, we know this circuit is good. Let's change this circuit and fix it so it is bad. Now that's stale data. Notice the point here where the splat was has moved. We need, this is this, this point right here does not have a value anymore that shows as being a locus on one of these swept values. We see 1.0 and 170 here, 1.0 and 180 here. This, the original value we had just a moment ago, was 1.0 microhenries for L1 and 170 picofarads for, C, for C1. So it moved. Now, if you were to sweep this with a lot more points than I did here, you would see that this, the outline line of, line of this actual area that's matched really doesn't change a whole lot. So that's how you can come along and believe that you don't have a problem when in fact you do have a problem. And sometimes you get away with it, sometimes you don't. So with this many points swept, you'd be hard pressed to see the difference in where the individual points lie. Hopefully this video has been informative and it gives you a little more insight into how SimSmith works. And hopefully, maybe, if you run into this in the future, you'll remember the video and, and it'll give you an idea as to what possibly occurred in your circuit. Thank you very much. And if you like the video, please give me a thumbs up. Any suggestions for future videos, let me know also.